Tomorrow is the first day of autumn. The seasons change, don't they? You can already feel it. You can feel it in the air. The nights are cooler. The leaves are falling. The squirrels seem busier than usual. Um, usually, um, up on Moon Mountain, where I have a place, the deer are very skinny by this time of year, but they, they seem to be a little bit fatter this year. I don't know why. Yeah, they, maybe they found more uh, of my plants to eat. I don't know. <laughs> but, but it is a, it is a time of change, a time of transition. And um, for those of you who know, my, my husband died last month. So it is indeed a time of transition for myself as well. <clears throat> and yet, and death, birth and death are not um, separate from life. Life includes birth and death. Every single moment, birth and death. Where are the thoughts that you thought last night? They're gone. <laughs> Where is the pain that you had three months ago? I hope it's gone. <laughs> it may not be. Um, you know, each moment arising and disappearing, each thought arising and disappearing, each season arising and disappearing, each life arising and disappearing in appearance, in appearance. So I thought that um, maybe a good thing to share with you, some of you are familiar indeed, I'm sure, with uh, this part of Ecclesiastes from the Bible, but it seemed appropriate uh, today especially. To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born, and a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken away from it. That which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been. <laughs> I left a few parts out, like eat, drink, and be merry. But I want you to know that that's part of the of the uh, wisdom of Ecclesiastes. We would like some of those things not to have a time, wouldn't we? <laughs> a time for war, or a time for killing, or a time for hatred, or a time for dying. We think that these things shouldn't be, but they come, don't they? They come when they come. They come in us, inside of us. And if we're honest, we can simply be present to the experience of the moment. Because that's all this presence is. It's, it's here now for this, whatever this is. Whether it's a time to mourn or a time to dance. Whether it's a time to grieve or a time to laugh. It's here, this, this, that I can't really describe because it's not an it. And yet, and yet, here it is, as what we truly are. So I felt like I, I wanted to share just a little bit of the process here with you because it might be helpful at some point for yourselves as well, or maybe not, doesn't matter.
You can do with it what you like. But a few days after my husband passed away, and by the way, those of you who know, he, he, he had cancer, which had gone into remission, and it continued to be in remission. But he died of an infection. He died of sepsis, um, which was a, a very unexpected twist of fate, as it were. Um, but life moves, doesn't it? Life moves the way it moves. So that's how it moved in our experience. But a few days after he, he passed away, I had had a pretty good night's sleep, and I decided I'd take a walk. And so I walked to um, the Lucas Center. You may not be familiar with that. It's a, it's a park in San Francisco that's in the Presidio. It's quite beautiful. And uh, my husband and I went there often. <clears throat> we took our little grandsons there very frequently. And it's just a very peaceful place. So I took a walk um, to this park, and I sat on the bench that we always sat on. And I hadn't expected, I think those of you who dealt with a death know you, 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 you don't necessarily know when grief will come, up, come upon you. So I sat on the bench and I, and, I, and I had a very strong, deep wave of grief sitting on that bench alone. But in the tears, very quickly, there was a sense of not being alone, that I had a, such a strong sense of his presence sitting next to me on this bench. And then a hummingbird came, just doing this incredible dance of, uh, I don't even know how to explain it, it was a dance. It was like high and low and around and very close. And it, it was as if that hummingbird was somehow a, a medium. It felt like a messenger from uh, the infinite, actually, from the infinite that has no birth, no death. And uh, and it threw, this may sound strange, but it was the experience through the medium of this hummingbird. It was as though my husband and I had a lovely conversation about um, karma and what we were playing out in this life and sort of an understanding from a very deep level. Um, And the hummingbird was very present and then after a while it went away. And so I was sitting there for a while and I had the feeling like, uh, maybe, you know, it's kind of time to get on with my day. So I didn't really want to leave, but you know, there was that sense of, well, it's probably time. So I said, okay, if it's time to leave, let me see the hummingbird. Right away, the hummingbird's right there. So I said, okay, I'll get up. I started walking toward the gate, toward the sidewalk where I would have walked home. And then as I was walking that direction, the hummingbird came again as if to beckon me another direction. <laughs> so I said, okay. I turned around and I went the other way um, toward what in the Lucas Center is is the Yoda Fountain. Now you guys may or may not know the Yoda Fountain, but it is a, it's a beautiful rendering of Yoda from Star Wars. And this is the Lucas Center, so it's, it's where a lot of the film was, you know. Uh, but at any rate, so there's this fountain, the Yoda Fountain, and so the hummingbird you know, seemed to lead me right there. So I sat down, and then the hummingbird disappeared. So I'm sitting there. It's quite lovely. And then um, I said to the universe, okay, um, spirit, you know, if you're really here, show me the hummingbird. And then what happened was not something that hadn't, happened before, or not something I didn't know, but this was an experience where, you know, you have insights or you have realizations, but then there are these moments where they just go all the way through. So what happened when I said showing the hummingbird was this, now you see me in the Yoda fountain. Now you see me as the water. Now you see me as the olive trees. Now you see me as the flowers. In other words, spirit, which is everywhere, is where we are, all of us, whether we're 
in form or whether formless spirit has returned, you know, has returned itself to itself completely. And as soon as, you know, it was like, you know, I realized that this, I wouldn't call it a demand, but this expectation that the hummingbird appear, it has to look like this. Don't we all have those moments? Okay, if this is really true, it needs to look like this, except that it doesn't always, does it? So as soon as that, you know, kind of just went through from my tip to the toes, you know, boom. The minute I kind of just caught that on this very deep visceral level, there was a hummingbird <laughs> right there drinking from the fountain, drinking water from the fountain. Yeah, isn't that incredible? And it was, it was, um, it was not the first time such an experience has happened since he's passed, but it just kind of is the felt sense, you know? Like, spirit is so palpable. If we have eyes to see, open heart, it's right here, isn't it? It's right here. It's nowhere else. Spirit is right here. It's, it's what we are through and through. It's what life is through and through and through. And, and when you know that you are that, you also see that everything and everyone and every moment is that, no matter what, no matter what. Birth is the appearance of that. Death is the supposed disappearance of form, and yet it's just transformation. It's just transformation. Everything is constantly transforming. If you take a walk in the woods, half of the woods is dead matter, quote, dead matter, right? Leaves that have fallen, you know, organisms that are eating the, the, the logs that have fallen, and so forth. Death is, is simply making space, <laughs> we could say, for the continual arising, arising of, of life, of form, of, of birth, and so forth and so on. So there's one other thing I'll re- read to you. I'm going to put my little pink thing away. But this, this wasn't, um, I didn't write this immediately after that experience, but sometime later I did write this. Um, but I wanted to share it with you all. It's just called On the Death of My Husband. My husband has transformed himself. He is not gone, but comes now as the fountain flowing, as bubbles in the stream, the great vast ocean, graceful olive trees and sturdy oaks. He flies to me as a hummingbird, wings shaping the sign of infinity, and hops about on the lush green grass as his favorite bird, a robin. At first he came so powerfully, almost in a human form, squeezing my hand, awakening me from slumber, lying in bed beside me, or sitting next to me on a park bench. But now his soul's journey no longer hovers in a familiar form. How can I grieve his freedom? How can I wish him back into a sick body? I do not. I miss his touch, his laugh, his generous spirit calling me to love more deeply. But these now live inside my heart, where they always did. Nothing was ever outside of this heart we share with all creation. My beloved has not departed. I feel his spirit everywhere I look. It blows as the wind that kisses my cheek. It tastes my tears, smiles at my joy. No, my husband is not gone, but merely transformed, as we all will be one day. Return to the formless spirit we are, even now, in these fragile yet resilient forms. Death is not an end, but a beginning of a deeper love, a deeper freedom, a deeper joy that confirms this truth. There simply is no separation. 
there simply is no separation. So, we die and we don't die, right? As the Heart Sutra says, you know, no ignorance and no end to ignorance. No old age and death and no end to old age and death. This is what we come to um, to have to confront, to have to grapple with, I think, in our life. You know, this seems to be, too, the formless and the form. If, if, we're, if we're not aware, if we haven't experienced, if, we haven't, if it hasn't revealed itself to us, the formless dimension of our being, then we're going to be completely identified with form completely identified with form, and herein lies a great deal of suffering. But when we have realized, or when it's been revealed, the formless dimension, whether we call it spirit, or the divine, or God, or Buddha nature, or Christ consciousness, the name is not it. But when we know that that is our essence, then it isn't about not having these experiences, you know, these experiences of form, of this relative world, of so-called birth and so-called death, it's realizing this is what's having the experience. Not something separate. This. The inquiry that I come back to frequently from Ramana and others, of course, who am I, what am I? See who? When you go deeply into that question, you don't get an intellectual answer. You come to, I don't know. That's the beginning of wisdom. Because this is an I don't know. This mystery is I don't know. This mystery can't be put into a box. It can't be limited by our words and our concepts, and even our scriptures. It can't be limited by anything the mind creates or thinks it understands. But when we know, we know that form and formless simply are not two. This is our non-dual nature. But let's don't use the term. Feel it, sense it. Not two, not two, not two. We think before we know, that our freedom will lie when all of this somehow gets resolved, right? (laughs) When there are no longer any neurotic tendencies, when there's no longer this or that, when everything is resolved in, you know, a tidy, neat little box we've taken care of all the... Then maybe, hmm, then maybe. But you see, this is here, not judging, just expressing just expressing itself as you, as this moment, as this feeling, as this thought, as this confusion, as this clarity, as this moment the mind thinks is beautiful, as this moment the mind thinks is ugly. It just is here, present. And there's a a clarity and a luminosity to what we truly are. It's constantly revealing itself. We don't have to go somewhere else. It reveals itself always, always, always. It's not hidden. It's not hidden. But we have to eyes to see that that's the case. Not someone telling us. So I always would invite you to have your own experience and to be true to your own experience and to to really stay in integrity with your own experience. So many people on the so-called spiritual journey are trying to match up their experiences with what they've read about or what they've heard about or what they think some someone else's experience is or was or should be. Trying to be like Jesus or the Buddha or Ramana or whoever you hold up to be separate from yourself, but nothing separate from yourself. You know, this that's awake in you, 
in me. It holds the whole thing. It is the whole thing. Your body is vast. It's not confined here. Anything you see, you can be. And I really, really appreciated, Norris, your poetry as always. But the depth of uh, realization of no control, what what arises in us when our bodies begin to fail, what arises in us when we begin to grok that maybe this ego we thought was a, a self really doesn't have the control it imagined it did. Because we're all, sooner or later, face to face with situations that we have no control over. And if we go deep enough, we realize we never did. We just claimed it. We just claimed it. Oh, I did this. But this just actually happened. Oh, I thought that. But thought just actually appeared. I, I succeeded. I failed. But actually, the moment's just arrived. It's not personal. None of it's personal. And yet, as your poetry really uh, touches, it's very intimate. It's very intimate. That's what makes it feel like it's personal, because it's so intimate. Our feelings, our grief, our joy, our confusion, our longing whatever it is, you know. It's so intimate. But it isn't personal. So as soon as we're not claiming experience, we're, we're actually able to have experience. <laughs> you know, we're not judging. It shouldn't be this. It should be something else. There's a tremendous freedom in that. So we, we're free to experience birth and death. Just experiences. And when we start to either lose control, quote, lose, or realize we don't have control, now that's a death. Is it not? It's a death. Because most of us are very, very fearful of losing control, of not being in control. We want to be God. The ego wants to be the one in charge of what should be and what should not be and how life should look. And we think, oh my goodness, if I let go of control, then my life wouldn't look the way I want it to look. Then I would just be, you know, at the mercy. And this is, you know, a terrible thing from the pers- perspective of ego. That illusory, the illusory self. <laughs> the one that thinks it's in charge. But when you begin to let go, and let go, and let go. There's something that eventually just says, ah, ah. Before the ah, there's probably a lot of turmoil, (laughs) and a lot of uh, fighting, and a lot of resisting, and a lot of trying, and a lot of striving, and a lot of effort. We've all known it, you know, effort to stay in, in, in control, to stay in charge. But what if you just let go? You see, what you're letting go into is not being a doormat for the world. That's the fear, isn't it? Well, then I just, you know, anything would go. I'd just be a doorman. You're letting go into a completely different dimension of your being. You're letting go of the dependence on egoic thought. Not that it won't arise, but you just see thought for what it is. You know, you're not placing ultimate truth on any of your thoughts. So, this letting go, I mean, the name of the whole so-called spiritual game is surrender. It's ultimately a failure to maintain separation, you know. And part of it is not fun from the ego's perspective. 
part of it feels like you're, you're something's being burned up, something's being cleared away. It's like, you know, whatever is in the way of our freedom gets to be brought right up into the surface. It just, you know, truth just puts our face right in it. Wherever we're working. You see, that's why to stay in integrity with your experience, to stay, you know, in truth about what actually is, is going on, what, what actually um, is the place where, you know, you know, we all know what those places are. Now, if we don't judge them, we can get curious where we're right up against something that we're resisting. If we don't say, oh, I shouldn't be resisting, we get interested in, hmm, what is this? What is this? What's the belief here? You know, what what am I pushing up against so hard that it just feels exhausting? What is it? You know, get interested. Don't judge it. Just get interested. Because as soon as we put the light of awareness anywhere, things begin to reveal themselves in, in deeper ways, in more useful ways, actually. So the holding on of control, or we could say personal will, you know, is something that the personal will is not going to be able to get rid of. (laughs) Being as though that's the very thing that's saying, I want to get rid of personal will. That's the paradox of that one. And yet, and yet, we don't know how, how, how to let go. But there's a time that you know you're just ready. You've had enough. You've had enough fight. You've had enough conflict. It doesn't mean though that life gets easy necessarily. It might get more challenging. But it will be challenging to a different in a different way. In a way that sees that everything is moving in its own flow. And you are part of that flow. It's happening through you. That flow is happening through you. And so you begin to see that decision making is not nearly as difficult as you thought it was at one point. It's more like staying attuned to how life wants to move as you, because you are that life. You are life. You are life. So how does it want to go left? Does it want to go right? You know, does it want to go, does it want to stop? We have a sense, you know, if we're, if we, if we stop now and then and just tune in, we have a sense. You have wisdom. We all have wisdom. We don't need to go somewhere else for it. It's right here within you. 